You know, I, I just talk, talked to the Episcopal clergy of the state here uh, last Friday, and um, I was trying to explain some of the same material. And my, when I told them, I can't prove this, I just have a strong intuition, that the word contemplation emerged already in the desert period, you know, because the word prayer had become so trivialized and cheapened by misuse. Mm -hmm. And we needed another word. That prayer had already become, you know, among many, this functional, pragmatic, telling God things, asking God for things, more and more limited to intercessory prayer, as we'd call it. But not this change of consciousness, not this this different pair of eyes. You, know, yeah. you could pray within your dualistic mind. You could pray within your normal, unconverted self. It didn't match conversion to prayer. Mm -hmm. and understand? Yeah. Yeah. So the unconverted self could really, and don't we all know this in mainline Christianity, really use God. There was no love affair with God. Mm -hmm. It was just. Well, this is the one who has all the power. We better get on his good side. And when we want things, we, we know who to go to. It was all the big daddy in the sky stuff. So contemplation became that word, admittedly, used in different ways by different people. But a subset, uh, more preferred in monastic settings and uh, poetic, maybe poetically minded Christians who were are more mystically minded Christians who who needed a word to say, I'm not just talking about saying prayers or recited prayers or formulaic prayers. You know? So you probably heard me say, I, I'm convinced it is a different mind. It's And, and I, I, the main way I can try to teach it is to put it in contradistinction to the antagonistic, problematic, calculating, uh, uh, mind which we largely operate of, out of, more, the more so we're educated, even more so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you've, uh, it's a major conversion for most Western people at this point in history. And uh, it, it seems that it largely got lost, except for the word, even in uh, the Catholic contemplative orders. Uh, pretty much after the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's just we, the contemplative, and it was Thomas Merton who pretty much revealed that. I always say he pulled back the veil mm -hmm. and told his own community in Kentucky, you're not contemplatives. You, some of you are, but by accident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many people do get there by accident, but not by systematic teaching. For really, I would say the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole thing's blown open in the last 30, 40 years. Yes. We're now we're rediscovering that there is a different mind that you have to practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to learn how to go there, mm -hmm. how to look out from a different pair of eyes than the problem-solving oppositional mind, mm -hmm. you know, the analytical mind. You know? And, uh, you know, when I wrote The Naked Now, where I first really tried to communicate this, I expected I'd really get a lot of pushback. I haven't. Mm. I haven't. Uh, quite the contrary, you know. Yeah. People just, if they give read it, which apparently a lot of people must, with some kind of open heart and mind, they see the truth of it. You mm -hmm. know? <laughs> it's just, you know, this is just sort of obvious. Yeah. And and the reason I think so much of Christianity has become so infantile and it does appear to be when you see racism and classism and love of war at the highest levels of people who call themselves Christian. You just know that they don't have the proper software, <laughs> yeah. I can call, to understand the Sermon on the Mount or the, the Gospels or, mm -hmm. yeah, or to know how to pray, really. The normal way the, the mind works, it, it knows things by comparison to something else. Yeah. And I've checked that out with doctors who will say that's absolutely the way the brain forms. It knows tall in relationship to short mm -hmm. when you're a little two-year-old. 
Now, for normal conversation, that's workable. You can get through life and know the difference between left and right and, and so forth. You know, <laughs> For any subtlety beyond that, it isn't very helpful anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that most of the world is somewhere between tall and short, strictly defined. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, here's the way I describe it. That what the mind does is divide the field of any moment or any event or any situation that first approaches you. Mm -hmm. So like, I just met you. The normal way, if I'm a calculating mind, is, okay, is he, is he tall? I noticed your Canadian accent. I had to differentiate you somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, he, is he American? Is he Canadian? Is he white? Is he something? Is he Christian? I find out all these things that allows me to take control of the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, to slowly practice, stop doing that. Mm -hmm. And to simply see across the board uh, everything as it is. So when you divide the field of the moment, that part which I'm comfortable with, which I'm already exposed to, which doesn't threaten me, which I understand, really, and this shows the narcissistic way of, of dualistic thinking, you call that true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that part of a situation which you've never been exposed to, threatens you, is outside your experience, you have no vocabulary for it, whatever, you call it false. Mm -hmm. Now to stop doing that, to stop dividing the field of every person, event, idea, or new situation that comes toward you, that's what you're practicing in early stage contemplation. That you no you notice your, your mental patterns. As one of the priests said last week, Richard, isn't that just mindfulness? I said, probably early stage contemplation probably is. It's mm -hmm. just, it doesn't, it, it's not yet union with God, not even close. Mm -hmm. But if you do want to talk about union with God, I'll tell you that mind has a much better chance of getting there because this Richard self is out of the way mm. with its pretentiousness, with its full of itselfness, with its uh, certainty about this idea or that idea. So when you can see everything equally, the way I usually say it is image of God, 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 mm. and I, image of God. And I don't need to say gay, straight, American, Canadian, black, white, uh, you know, attractive, unattractive, with me or against me. Mm -hmm. Now that takes work to retrain. So that's why it's a different mind. You're rewiring this. Mm -hmm. Through contemplation. Uh, yeah, through to stop retraining uh, to start retraining this mind, which wants to pigeonhole everything. Mm -hmm. So I've been saying re er, er, lately, and it seems to be well understood by so many people, better than I thought I even understood it myself, um, is that the opposite of faith is not doubt, uh, as you know, I'm sure, but it's control. Mm -hmm. And to give up this controlling of every idea, person, event, moment. So prayer is this massive surrendering of, of certitude and order and clarity and a need for order and clarity to be able to say that it is what it is what it is uh, without my categories mm. without my labeling I've been uh, suggesting to some groups that maybe labeling is actually a better word to use when Jesus and the Buddha too both say, do not judge, because we know there is a place for appropriate judgments, you know. Mm -hmm. But labeling everything is actually an attempt to control it with your wow. little system uh -huh. you know, of understanding. Is it threatening to me? Is it not threatening to me, you know? Wow. Is it for me or against me? So uh, I, I call contemplation the change that changes everything. It's the pearl of great price. It tells you how to see, not what to see. And we have wasted so many centuries trying to convince people of dogmas and doctrines, we Catholics, uh, which they, yes, we believe, we believe, we believe, but they believed it with a mind that was largely useless for spiritual purposes. Mm -hmm. I love to use uh, the First Corinthians second chapter, which some have called Paul's Sermo Sapientia, his Sermon on Wisdom. Uh, and if you remember in a, a rather extended, somewhat convoluted logic, as Paul's often is, he says we must understand spiritual things in a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. 
you know and and when jesus says oh it sounds like is god planting in us misunderstanding you will see but not understand talking about the parables you know mm -hmm. you will know but you will not know i think that's what he's talking about this mm. this first level of knowledge that is largely dualistic problem-centered self-referential uh it cannot know things certainly at a love level you can't love things mm -hmm. with the dualistic mind you really can't mm -hmm. and anybody you love i'm assuming you're both married uh, somehow you achieve the ability to see your wife's faults here and there and be able to overlook them you mm -hmm. understand that yeah, yeah. Okay, your dualist might say, well, I do wish I could change that little thing in her. <laughs> and I'm sure she thinks the same thing about you, of course. Mm -hmm. But for certain people, isn't it wonderful, like your children, I hope, too, God gives you this wonderful grace to over overstep that. Mm -hmm. I know it, but damn it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't matter. That's non-dual. So here in Naked Now, I say that normally getting through the day the dualistic mind is enough mm -hmm. but you will hit a ceiling now in that book I said there's five things above the ceiling that you cannot adequately process with your dualistic mind love death suffering any notion of eternity or infinity and any honest notion of God you're talking about mystery you're, you can't deal with that with mm -hmm. the dualistic mind since I wrote the book, I would add sexuality, too. I think mm -hmm. sexuality is in the realm of mystery. That, and why so much of our sexual morality has failed is because we try to teach it rationally, as if, as if you could. Uh, yeah. But you allow those six things to, to be beyond calculation, beyond, and, and put on your different thinking cap, as the nuns used to say to us, uh, you need a different mind to process suffering. Mm -hmm. You need a different mind to process love. Mm -hmm. That's the contemplative mind. Mm -hmm. The best thing is to invite them to observe their stream of consciousness with some degree of honesty and to notice the patterns. This doesn't sound spiritual at all. I'm sorry, but it really is. Mm -hmm. It's an exercise in huge kenosis, mm -hmm. <laughs> letting go. Because you're going to see that not just a few people are OCD. The universal addiction is that all people are addicted to their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. We all are. I am, you are, you are. Why wouldn't you be? Mm -hmm. You process things in a certain way. You have to suffer that humiliation by seeing how silly it is. That this dog of my mind is going back to the same vomit, to quote Proverbs. The, the, every 30 seconds, I'm tending to resentment, whatever it might be. I'm tending to judgmentalism. I'm tell, tending to dismissal. Whatever your pattern is, mm -hmm. paranoia, anger, superiority complex. Uh, oh my God, this is humiliating. Now, I think that's why contemplation so easily has died out again and again. Mm -hmm. Because when the Spirit, you know, Mark 1, 13, 13 to 50, when the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness, you have to be driven there almost. And the first thing that comes up are the wild beasts, if you remember the text. Huh? Yeah. The wild beasts, just all your crap, I hate to say it. All Saint your, Antony as well. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Mm -hmm. All your silly, stupid patterns. Mm -hmm. Of repetitive, you know, it was um, uh, Eckhart Tolle who lives in Vancouver that I, I wrote to after he wrote his book, The Power of Now, and I thanked him. I said, you know, you really opened up the older contemplative tradition, but you did it in a most wise way without using Christian vocabulary mm -hmm. so people could write you off. Mm -hmm. But we call it the practice of the present moment or the uh, sacrament of the presence of God in, mm -hmm. in Catholic vocabulary. Uh, and I said, you said it without saying it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And in that first book, if you ever read it, at that point he says 82% of human thought is repetitive and useless. And somewhat jokingly, I wrote to him, he lives in a rather simple apartment close to the airport in, mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. in Vancouver. And um, 
he wrote me back a sweet note because uh, I said I only disagree with you on one point. I think it's 92%. And I was saying it somewhat facetiously. But if you look at his latest book, he says 98%. Mm. Wow. 98% of human thought is repetitive and useless. Mm. So, you know. Whole cities uh, running on that stream on, of thought. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Mm. You know, it's so humiliating to see this that we think, <clears throat> think the same thought over and over and over again. So when Descartes, who we've been making the whipping boy for hundreds of years, rightly so, I think therefore I am, he actually was half right. The Western person thinks they are their thinking. Mm -hmm. And their thinking is stinking thinking mm -hmm. by spiritual standards. It's obsessive, compulsive, repetitive, paranoid, angry. I mean, look at our politics. Uh, yours appears to be a little better than ours. Uh, but you just want us to cry. Mm. at the level of American political discourse. Mm. So we can have all these people we've sent to universities, educated in intellect, but have not gone above the ceiling to wisdom. If you notice both in Isaiah and in Paul, when they are, yeah, Paul, when they list the, um, fruits of the Spirit. Uh, they distinguish knowledge from wisdom. And I remember actually asking my professor back in the late 60s, why well, aren't those the same thing? And he didn't know how to explain it. But he, no, they're different, he said, knowledge and wisdom. Well, I think knowledge, and it's good to have good dualistic, clear-headed thinking. I always have to say that, or people accuse me of being dualistic, mm -hmm. of course. I have to say there's a place for dualistic thinking, mm -hmm. uh, but you hit the ceiling. And above the ceiling is wisdom, mm -hmm. which is always a gift to the spirit. Because the logical, rational mind doesn't go there. It's normally great love and great suffering. That's why you can go there for your wife and your children. You can go there, you know, if you've suffered great grief or great tragedy in your life, you'll find yourself temporarily, without even knowing it, in the space of, of contemplative thinking. Mm. You'll see things in a non-dualistic way for a few weeks or months in the presence of great love and great suffering. Mm. And let me end with this, that what contemplation is, in my way of saying it, is how do you maintain the fruits of what you learned in great love and great suffering? So many people who become contemplatives without ever joining a monastery or becoming orthodox, they still get there mm -hmm. be, by great love and great suffering. But it's still very hard to maintain it across the board unless you develop a practice that rewires this somewhat permanently. Mm -hmm. Now in moments of hunger and anger and loneliness and tiredness, we all revert back to the lower levels, of right. course. Now on the on the action side, oh, yeah. I, I was I was I've been reading your daily meditations, oh. right? And, uh -huh. and I I thought, well, there's a lot of we're doing a lot of contemplation, but what about action? And then the next day you came out with a Dorothy Day part, oh, and then Chavez, yeah. and, um, and when I'm thinking of action, though, I, I I see quite a spectrum. Like there's a sort of yes. protest activism, but yes. also relief and development, but maybe also whatever it is to do justice in the world. Did you unpack some of that, what action yeah. means to you? Uh, first of all, you notice that I put it first in our title, precisely because I feared what has often happened. People who are more interior people or see religion as an interior thing entirely uh, want to avoid the action component. Mm -hmm. It's been people like the Mennonites who've kept us from that. But that's never been mainline Christianity, I'm sorry to say. We like to separate religion from engagement or embodiment, mm. incarnation. Um, so, first of all, I try to distinguish action from activism. I don't believe everybody is called to be an activist. And by that I mean that they are really called to be on the front line of protest or, uh, or uh, opposing the system. A lot of people just can't handle that intellectually or emotionally uh, or relationally uh, they have to I, I tell them at least withdraw their loyalty from the idolatrous systems 
You get, it's enough to just convince them to do that. Mm -hmm. But do they have to actively go out and oppose it on a weekly, monthly basis? Not necessarily. That's what I call activism. But they better give their moral, spiritual support to people who do feel called to that. Someone has got to be doing the work of Dorothy Day and Cesar Chavez, you know. And we better know how to tell people that's the gospel, too. Mm. Uh, that's what's so wonderful about Pope Francis right now, that we got mm. this coming from the highest levels. Uh, but by the word action itself, I largely mean embodiment, incarnation, that this can't just remain theory. This, can't, this belief system that you have can't just remain a belief system. It has to somehow engage your behavior, your politics, your pocketbook, your, your way of, of situating yourself in this world. Now, admittedly, you know, when I started this center 29 years ago, I, I used to teach all the uh, interns who'd come we take them down to live with the poor in Juarez, across the border. Uh, I pretty much taught 50-50, liberation theology and contemplative practice. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably honest to say that now 85% of what I teach is just unlearning lousy theology mm -hmm. and teaching contemplative practice, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just constantly an obstacle. To, I mean, things like the lousy atonement theory, which yeah. just has such horrible implications, mm -hmm. you know, for the nature of God and the nature of the divine human relationship and so forth. So because God gave me this certain gift of teaching and articulating, I said, okay, I guess that's my gift. Mm -hmm. And I seldom go to a protest march here in the city anymore. And I've incurred a lot of criticism for that, too. Mm -hmm. I, I support and encourage all the people who do it. But they could eat me up every week. Just mm -hmm. this is your job to be, show your face at all these things. Right. You know? uh, I hope plenty of people are doing it. And I do it once in a while. But I'm not an activist anymore. Mm -hmm. But I hope my lifestyle is, is showing that it's got to be, it's got to affect my behavior, the way I vote, the way I use my money, the way I relate the way I uh, care uh, and what I care about in this world. Frankly, it changes your politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're much more concerned about the least of the brothers and sisters than the, the top of the brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I don't see that, I really question whether there has been the, the software change up here. Mm -hmm. If I don't see some kind of alignment with powerlessness, mm -hmm some kind of a new understanding of, of uh, this, this preferential side, as we Catholics are saying anymore, uh, of the gospel, I don't think they've got the whole gospel yet. So mm. for me, it's the test case mm. that the whole thing has taken shape, uh, that there's this switching of alignment to an idealization of war and money and power and beautiful people mm -hmm. <laughs> and that just stops losing its interest mm -hmm. it, it almost just happens automatically mm -hmm. every year the more you become a contemplative and you see image of god image of god image of god image of god and the good looking people don't have it more than the the handicapped people mm -hmm. yeah. that's that's the test So is there a politics of Jesus in all this? Remember Yoder's book? And, yeah. Um, what well, would your angle on it be? You know, I put it this way. I tried to just hint at it. But I think it first of all has to do with the withdrawing of enthralledom and loyalties. That, that it, the, This whole game of good looks, big cars, success, power, money, war important people, it loses its enchantment for you. It, that's how your politics changes. That, that um, you withdraw your loyalty from the military industrial complex. Now, does that mean you've got to protest every war? Uh, at least by withholding your, your support of it, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that much the gospel requires of you, that you can't be uh, enthralled by all these systems of power and money and, mm -hmm. and illusion. Uh, and as you know, it's hard enough to just get people there, yeah. <laughs> the withdrawing. And I would say it, it takes for many people a good five to ten years mm -hmm. to unravel the implications of what they now experience as the shape of reality and to see that their politics changes. And of course their politics changes to such a degree that at least in our country, uh, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats are very attractive. Do you understand? Yeah. It's not like you can go back into a dualistic split and say, yeah. well, now I'm a Democrat and not a Republican. But right. conventional yeah. politics is all about labels and us and them. Yeah, and it's yeah. just the whole thing is pretense. Yeah. Mm. So you do have to suffer this massive disillusionment. Mm -hmm. And you'll find during that period, I've seen it in so many, that especially if they came from a middle class or upper middle class family or a military family, they're just sort of quiet for almost five years. Mm -hmm. just, they, they're afraid to say what they're beginning to intuit because they can't say it at the family gatherings. They, they're not even sure it's safe to say it around people here. They, they test the waters, mm -hmm. do you understand? Yeah. Because it feels so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Have I really withdrawn my loyalty to the banking system even? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> well, these, these things that are considered too big to fail, the penal system, yeah. all of them, they're just a bunch of pretense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And as that all falls apart, which you took as the upstanding institutions of American civilization, uh, you feel pretty, uh, you know, no place to lay your head. Mm -hmm. No place to lay your head for a while. And especially when mainline Christianity, Roman Catholicism, was pretty much in bed with all those institutions for centuries, yeah. uh, you're not sure you're Roman Catholic anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, which, in that sense, they're not. Yeah. You know? Well, if I could ask you about one other topic before mm. we... I, I, we'll go over now. These are good questions. Um, uh, one thing people like you or Bishop Desmond Tutu have brought to the table is a, like a really substantive interfaith exchange. Merton yeah. as well, and, yeah. and you know, and then, which then always raises the question, it's like, okay, he's quoting Buddha, he's quoting Jesus. Oh, yeah. um, and... And then that almost invites uh, you to talk about the uniqueness of Christ. What does that mean in light of non-dualistic conversation? Is there still a, a place for Christians to talk about mm. the uniqueness of Christ without? Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, so how do you navigate that? Well, of course, this deserves an hour of subtlety at least. Well, let mm. me say just a few things. But let me say with the most outlandish way, first of all, I, the proof that you really have gotten Christ is that you can see Christ in all religions. Yeah. That's the proof mm -hmm. that you found Christ. Uh, it's so, so paradoxical, you know, uh, that you have these universal eyes for the mystery, for, for the incarnation. Now, that's why, uh, I don't know if you've read my stuff or listened to my stuff on the cosmic Christ. Mm -hmm. The great weakness of, of mainline Christianity, even more Protestant than Catholic, I have to say, is for the most part, they were never told about the cosmic Christ. First Colossians might as well have not been written. First Ephesians might as well not have been written. The prologue to John's Gospel might as well not have been written. Uh, they had almost no effect on Protestant Christianity. We had it in Orthodoxy. We had it in many of our Catholic mystics. But even in our churches, it was a subtext. More, much better in the Orthodox than the, than the Western Church because you had Mac Maximus the Confessor and some of the early fathers who understood this. Uh, we had Don Scotus, the Franciscan, in, in our tradition. Uh, so I, I would predict that the next century is not just going to be a rediscovery or a discovery of the centrality of the Trinity, which undercuts dualistic thinking, by the way, mm -hmm. but also the balancing out of Jesus with Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, John's Gospel, that, that most notorious line that is almost always quoted to me, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
I said, that's the eternal Christ speaking, mm -hmm. as is almost all of John's gospel. It's a completely different voice than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Isn't that obvious? You know, that I mean, we got the cosmic Christ speaking here, and he's speaking truth. The, the Christ mystery is the way, the truth. Whenever matter and spirit come together and are revealed as one, whenever divine and human are come together, we have the Christ mystery which Colossians and Ephesians and the prologue say existed since the beginning of time. So the Christ has been available to the Stone Age people, to the Persians, to the Mayans, to the Aztecs, to the Native Americans, to the Hindus, to the Buddhists, of course. You know, the main trouble with people is our Christ is so small. Mm -hmm. It's just... They, 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 their God isn't very big at all. It's largely, Jesus has been understood and interpreted largely at a tribal level. Tribal level of consciousness, and we want people to join our tribe. And you just go to the four Gospels, particularly the Synoptic Gospels, you have anything but tribal teaching, where he's always honoring, and you know this, the Samaritan, the non-Jew, the, the pagan, the sinner, the outsider, it's so constant. You have to say after a while, this is perverse bad will not to see that. Mm -hmm. It's bad will that Christians keep creating an in-house spirituality, a tribal spirituality that, that do we have two Jesuses. The Jesus before he died was clearly inclusive. But after he died and rose from the dead, he created an exclusionary religion. You know, <laughs> well, it's just, come on, you know. Mm -hmm. And the world can't uh, take that seriously anymore. Mm -hmm. it's just, so, I'm proudly Christian, and, and uh, it's precisely my Christ that gives me not just permission, but a big shove mm -hmm. <laughs> in the direction of seeing him seeing this Christ mystery everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, not just in those who wear the label Christ. Mm -hmm. And of course, you and I both know that many who wear the label Christ mm -hmm. are sometimes the least exemplary of the Christ mystery because mm -hmm. they live in this tribal small world. Mm -hmm. So th this will be the rediscovery of Christ if I, I don't know what this health issue is going to mean, but if I if I do get to write one more book, I'd really like to make this really clear and biblical and mm -hmm. obvious because it's so easy to make it obvious. It, yeah. it doesn't really take a lot of effort, mm -hmm. and it, it disappoints me that the evangelicals, for example, who who say they love Scripture so much, didn't see this first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That we're talking about something bigger here than Jesus of Nazareth. Huh? Yeah. Jesus became the Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus was proclaimed the Christ. Jesus revealed the Christ. But the Christ existed from all eternity. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Yeah. So Christ alone, but not Christians alone. Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, there's a first good corollary. Yeah, I would still, but I wouldn't say that to a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus says, I talk this way when I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. But I talk another way when I'm talking to the crowds. Mm -hmm. There's in-house language. Most of John's gospel is in-house language, yeah. you know, talking to the believers. Mm -hmm. And I would, when I'm preaching here at this parish church on the corner, I'm talking to Catholics. I know what I can get away with and what I can't get away with. You know? But then when I talk to educated or secular or Jewish people, I talk to some lawyers in Santa Fe on Tuesday, mm -hmm. many of whom were non christian I had to completely change my vocabulary. But, boy, were they with me mm. in this very direction, mm. too. Yeah, wow. yeah, that's what's so exciting. Now, when you can, as Paul says, try to be all things to all people, and not just, you know, the way I interpret what the evangelicals call the Great Commission, which is a fine phrase, but it isn't really in the Scriptures, uh, but to preach the gospel to all nations, what he's really telling us is, Talk to outsiders. You know, talk to other people than yourself. Mm. That's the import of that passage. Mm. Because when all you do is talk to yourself, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you really think that your in-house vocabulary, redemption, salvation, immaculate conception, if you're Catholic, 
that everybody understands that or is supposed to agree with that. And, and pretty soon it makes you a, a foreign entity. Mm. You're not preaching the gospel to all the nations. Mm. So uh, we've got all the tools to do it in the scriptures. Mm. You know, I, I know some people think that uh, maybe I'm not scriptural, but that's actually my field. That's, that's what I love, you know. To show that we had it all the time, but you can only see what you're told to pay attention to. Yeah. And we weren't told to pay attention to a whole bunch of things. Right? Every one of our churches, ours especially, we paid attention to very limited scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Karl Rahner, the German Jesuit, he said, we could drop the doctrine of the Trinity tomorrow. And 98% of Christian practice would remain untouched and unchanged. You know? It's nothing but a theory you know, that none of us would think of disagreeing with, but in fact has had no pastoral practical effect on, on the development of most Christianity. Much more in orthodoxy, I'm happy to say, and much more in Catholicism than Protestantism. You know? It got thinner the farther we got away, thinner and thinner. You know, Cynthia Bourgeau, who was this Episcopal woman priest in, on our core faculty here, uh, she likes to speak, the principle of two is always oppositional. Whenever you're dualistic, you have to compare. Mm -hmm. And you immediately choose one side to be higher, one side to be lower. The principle of three, she just approaches it, first of all, philosophically, is always dynamic. It keeps you flowing. It keeps you moving. Instead of choosing between two, you keep moving between three. Uh, the principle of, of the Trinity was made to order to defeat the dualistic mind. Because you know? it does not satisfy the dualistic mind. God is not one. God is not three. Rationality falls apart at that point. So the exciting thing, I think, is, of course, quantum physics astrophysics, uh, uh, the nature of the atomic universe, the nature of galaxies. If, if what Genesis said is true, let us create in our image. <laughs> what is going on there in the first chapters of Genesis? You know, that the universe is created in the shape of God. That, that now we see everything is relational. That God is an event of communion that God is relationality itself, that God is communion itself, that God is a flow. So you just got to let that undo the image of, uh, apparently you see my daily meditations once in a while, the old man with a white beard sitting on a throne. That's, that's gone. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is it hasn't been gone. It's, it remained in Christian art, you know, perhaps still uh, most would, you know an old man with a white beard sitting on a throne. That's not Trinitarian theology. Even if he is holding the crucified Jesus and the dove is above him. You know, we tried to put it in our art, but because we, we just didn't know how to picture flow, communion, relationship. Uh, St. Bonaventure, our Franciscan mystic, he called uh, the Trinity the fountain fullness of love, like a water wheel, always outpouring one to the other in one direction. And so any notion, if you read Bonaventure's writings, there's nothing like you'll see centuries later of hellfire, brimstone, judgment, merit, damnation, atonement, mm -hmm. punishment, wrath, and God. It just saddens me. I actually listen to Christian music a lot when I'm driving because a lot of the words are so beautiful for when I'm suffering anyway. But the one, part that isn't beautiful is how much the, the older ones, not the more recent ones, you love to use the word wrath. Mm. My God, it's in every other song, wrath. wrath. Mm -hmm. When you have a Trinitarian theology, there's no wrath in God. Mm -hmm. There's no room for wrath. It's, it's a theological impossibility. You understand? It doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we see that so much of our image of God was taken from from the early tribal primitive understanding of the old man with the beard, as it were, sitting on a throne, mm -hmm. never really undone by the re revelation of Jesus 
as the, the son of the father revealing the heart of the father and then giving us that presence in the indwelling Holy Spirit. That changes everything mm -hmm. about the nature of God. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I really hope we keep unpackaging the Trinity yeah. because it will change Christianity mm -hmm. radically, radically.